So um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's UK CCSRLC webinar session. My name is Gloria Mensa from the University of Sheffield, and it's my pleasure to chair our webinar session for today. So today we've got two talks, and we will be hearing about some UK CCSRLC research updates. Our first speaker is Caroline Ganza, and she will be speaking on decarbonisation of power and industry in the UK and the role of CCS. So I'm just going to briefly introduce Caroline now. So Caroline is a PhD student, a PhD candidate at the Center for Process Systems Engineering and the Center for Environmental Policy at the Imperial College London. Her research is focused on integrated modeling of the decarbonization of power, heat, transport, and industry in the UK. She has achieved an MSc in Advanced Chemical Engineering from Imperial College London in 2018 and a BSc in Mechanical Engineering from RWTH Arch University in 2017. In addition to her academic work, Caroline has also has been active as a consultant to the public and private sector since 2018. So what we're going to do now is that um, we'll have Caroline speak for about 15 to 20 minutes and then we can take some questions after. Um, if you have some questions along the line, you can just pop them in the chat box or you can raise your hand and then I'll call on you to ask Caroline directly. So I'll just hand over now to Caroline, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Gloria, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you to UK CCSRC for inviting me to give this talk. And um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about the carbonization of power industry in the UK and specifically the role of CCS. Why is this interesting? So with the decarbonization of power, it's generally very well understood. Power is the single largest uh, CO2 emission source has been investigated at length. Um, decarbonization in industry, on the other hand, is considered notoriously difficult. Uh, in the power market, it's mostly domestic. And so the power is consumed usually where it is produced. And there's not that much trade. This is, of course, different in industry. And industry is closely connected to international markets. So competitiveness is a factor to be taken into account here. Um, Furthermore, power can provide negative emissions through bioenergy with CCS, and industry, on the other hand, might require those offsets for its residual emissions. And lastly, industry, abatement in industry specifically, might also add power demand to the power sector. And um, so you have these uh, at least two links between power and industry, so it makes look at them together. This is the model architecture that I'm trying to build during my time as a PhD student. So we have this energy systems optimization model ESO in the group that we maintain, and I am adding a representation of transport, heat, and the industrial sector. The idea is to not only include economical factors, but also expand the model to feature social KPIs such as the GDP and employment. Just to give you a taste of what the model can do, this is the um, pathway, one pathway for the power sector to net zero and it's under a carbon price trajectory. And what you can see is you add a lot of renewables. This is uh, um, solar, offshore and onshore wind. And you switch from CCGT, which is red, to CCGT CCS, which is orange. And then you get this trajectory for the emissions. You do not get to net zero because for that you need negative emissions or a uh, entirely renewable system. And you can look at the dispatch schedule as well. So you have renewables contributing a large share of the power and CCGT CCS having this nice load following role in the system and CCGT providing power on peak phase. Let me get to the research questions that I would like to cover today. First of all, which industrial sectors represent the largest emitters in UK industry and which options do we actually have for abatement in these industrial sectors? Next, which pathways lead to net zero for power and industry together? And how much carbon offset do we actually need from power? Can decarbonization and domestic production be incentivized using a border tax adjustment? And lastly, which combinations of carbon price and negative emissions credit actually achieve net zero in this system? Together, the first question, this is uh, looking at the emissions in UK power and industry. So these are emissions from point sources and about half of them are from power and half of them are from industry. And the first thing you notice is that when you disaggregate by size, they exist over a very wide range of point source sizes. 
and um, especially with the small point sources, it's going to be very difficult to um, have abatement options for these very small point sources. When you disaggregate by sector, you notice that half of UK industrial emissions stem from two steel plants, six refineries, and 11 cement plants. And so in the first instance, we chose those for modeling. And for the other half, uh, we assume that we need offsets for all of these 30 megatons of emissions. You can also have a look at the spatial distribution of these, these top industrial emitters, and you can see that we have these well-known industrial clusters where it would make sense to start something like CCS. We looked at the age distribution, uh, the different sizes and the emissions uh, of all the point sources, and then grouped them and then averaged them appropriately. I'll now introduce you to some abatement technologies in the three sectors that we chose. First of all, cement. In the figure, you can see oxy combustion for cement, which is considered one of the um, most advanced options for CO2 capture in the cement industry. Cement is, of course, produced using limestone. That means we have about 60% process emissions. And that means every technology option that we have will require carbon transport and carbon sequestration. In our model, we include oxy combustion, post-combustion capture, calcium looping, both integrated and tail end, and membrane-assisted liquefaction as well. In the steel industry, um, traditional process involves a blast furnace and a basic oxygen furnace, and where you, of course, uh, reduce iron ore to iron uh, with a lot of fuel, such as coal. At the top of the blast furnace, you have blast furnace off gas, which is the main CO2 source. And when you capture CO2 from there, you're able to reduce emissions substantially. An alternative in the steel industry is also fuel switching. When you reduce with hydrogen instead, you can potentially have zero carbon steel making. And when you uh, switch from coal to biochar, you can actually um, obtain carbon negative steel. We also in include secondary steel making from scrap via electric arc furnaces, and we consider it limited by the availability of scrap. The third sector we are considering is refineries, and they're actually quite um, challenging to model because refineries are collections of point sources. They all have varying CO2 concentrations, fuel gas flow rate, and accessibility. So post combustion capture is actually a little bit complicated. We include two different options for abatement in our model, one that has more emissions reduction, one that has less emissions reduction. I would like to point out at this point that the data for all of these technologies is often unknown or uncertain. Some are at pilot plant stage, but others are at lab stage and others are purely theoretical. So keep this in mind with all the results, this will change in the future. A couple of key assumptions here. We operate under a net zero carbon target of 2050 with a linear trajectory. We have no carbon price or negative emissions credit as otherwise stated. Biomass in the power sector has embodied emissions and these are counted towards the carbon target and penalized by the carbon price. We constrain build rates based on historical data and we increase them when necessary. In the power sector, we assume that about 50% of transport and heat are electrified and the shape of the and the shape and the magnitude of the power demand curve change as a result of that. So we get a more seasonal demand curve and we get a peak here one as well. The electricity consumption of the industrial plants is directly added to the demand in the power sector. I believe this is a hard link between the two sectors. And as I mentioned before, 50% of the industrial emitters, which are not explicitly modeled, they require offsets in 2050. Another important point that we need to cover in industry is of course trade. And we'll use this flow chart that is used in literature as well for modeling um, import and export. So you have UK industry and some of the total production is domestic delivery going to the UK market and the rest is of course export. And similarly, the total demand for the UK market is comprised of domestic delivery and import. I have turned these two ratios, the import and export ratio. So you have the import over total demand and the export over total production. And what that helps is in a way that we can hold these ratios constant in order to try and preserve the structure of the market as we look at the evolution of the market leading up to 2050. From these ratios arise four scenarios. 
first of all, BAU on offset is the simplest one. We assume that we just produce the way we, we, we always have without abatement and keep the ratios constant. That means we need VEX to offset all of these emissions. The abate and offset scenario means we just make abatement available and see if it gets deployed. It is possible to just offshore all the industrial emissions, which means you slowly increase the import ratio and at the end of the day, import all the commodities instead of producing them yourself. Lastly, the abate and export scenario, um, you deploy uh, low carbon technologies in industry and you deploy actually more than you need for just the UK and then you export um, the commodities and have um, a potential economic boost. The deployment of the individual technologies depends on when they become available to the system, when old capacity retires and the relative abatement costs. And again, many of these parameters are unknown or uncertain. So these results may change as we improve our model. So without further ado, I will show you some results. First of all, the BAU and offset scenario. So in this case, I'm always showing you the um, amount produced, imported and exported for cement, steel and refineries. So in this scenario, all the retiring capacity is just replaced with new built high carbon plants. You expand a little bit on um, steel making from scrap because it is economical and it adds a little bit of demand to the power sector. In this case, you can see the evolution of the process on the left and the total emissions on the right. You need about 13 gigawatts of facts to deliver all the negative emissions. And it is uh, 66 megatons of CO2 in total. And you can see power balancing out the industrial emissions here. What if we make abatement available now? Um, what we notice immediately, and which is um, interesting from the start, is that abatement is preferred over BACS carbon offsets. So we have, despite the higher cost, of course, um, abatement installed in every sector. In cement, oxy combustion is preferred all, over all the other options, both for retrofit and for new build. For steel, we expand the secondary steel making as in the previous scenario, and uh, the existing capacity is retrofitted with bio-CCS delivering some negative emissions. And in the refining sector, the higher amount of post-combustion capture is optimal. This means that we need less BEX capacity, only 10 gigawatts, and BEX needs to deliver uh, less negative emissions. So only balancing out the 30 gigawatts that we uh, can't abate yet. And I think three gigawatts residual emissions from cement, steel and refining. If we compare the cost in the BAU and the abatement scenario, we know it's actually the same within the margin of error. And that means that when you deploy CCS in industry, it's not more expensive than BAU and you also leave more room for BEX to offset other sectors such as aviation, which are difficult to abate. Interestingly, when a carbon price is applied to the industrial emissions, this scenario becomes much cheaper because um, you deploy CCS once and then over many time periods, you save on the carbon price. In the third scenario, we analyze what happens in when we offshore all the industrial emissions. So in every sector, we slowly increase the amount that we import, we retire all the plants or shut them down prematurely. Of course, we need even less specs in this scenario, about 9.5 gigawatts, and they're delivering, delivering 48 megatons of CO2 negative emissions in 2050, offsetting these 30 gigawatts and then 18, sorry, <laughs> these 30 megatons a year, and then 18 megatons from power as well. In the fourth scenario, what happens um, when we actually build more capacity and then export the commodities? Steel and cement oxy combustion is the preferred choice. In steel, the new build plants would optimally be bio CCS. And in the refining, as we've seen before, the higher amount of post combustion capture is preferred. What's interesting is that even though you build a lot of capacity in the industrial sector, because it's all low carbon, you actually don't need to change the power sector much. You don't need much more BEX capacity in order to absorb the residual emissions. Uh, so this is very similar to the um, base and offset scenario. 
And this might, so it might be advantageous to actually go for this because of the potential economic boost. One more thing that I would like to share is CO2 for transport and storage. So in each of the scenarios, you're going to um, have a different amount of CO2 that needs to be transported and sequestered. In the import and offshore scenario, this is the minimum amount of CO2 that our model predicts. And this would be about 65 megatons a year. If industrial emissions are actually abated, this number rises to 85 megatons a year. And in the abate and export scenario, it's about 130 megatons a year for transport and storage. We notice as well that we start with CCS in industry, and then we add CCS in power later, and actually surpasses in the amount of CO2 captured in 2050. Just a side note, what happens when we add the carbon price to our abate and offset scenario? This has a few consequences. First of all, CCS in industry is deployed 10 years sooner. So um, actually as soon as possible, because then cumulatively until 2050 save a lot of money on the carbon price. In the power sector, we see that CCGT CCS replaces CCGT a lot sooner and BEX is deployed later. This makes sense, of course, because you need much less, you have less residual emissions in power because of CCGT CCS. So you need less, less BEX and you can deploy it later. The border tax adjustment. So this is the one policy instrument that has been proposed to boost domestic production and also decarbonize. In this work, we assume that the border tax adjustment is in pounds per ton of CO2. It's multiplied by the carbon intensity of the imported product, and that leads to a penalty on import. For now, we assume that the import price is like the conventional technology. Same for the carbon intensity, assume that the BTA is constant over time. So the comparison that we're actually seeing here is between domestic production, which is baseline production cost plus CCS if it's deployed, a carbon tax if that's considered, and a carbon offset cost. And this is then compared to the import cost plus the border tax adjustment. And we found that this actually does work. So I'm showing you for cement what happens when you increase the border tax is adjustment from zero to 75 pounds per ton of CO2. And first you see that you force the system to produce more with the existing high CO2 capacity. Then and when it increases, you get a little bit of a retrofit CCS. And with a higher BTA, you actually are able to obtain a system where everything is produced via CCS and you have a low carbon system. The last point I would like to address is the question how to achieve net zero using the carbon price and the negative emissions credit. And um, so I've, I've, run to, I've had um, sensitivity runs for this. Um, you have the carbon price on the one hand and the negative emissions credit. On the other hand, the negative emissions credit, of course, is a monetary reward that technologies receive that remove carbon from the atmosphere. And every um, point to the right of this red line is actually carbon negative for power and industry together. What can we see in this figure? First of all, any negative emissions credit above 138 pound per megaton of CO2 achieves net zero, sorry, per ton of CO2. <laughs> That's a typo right there. Um, actually achieves net zero for power and industry in our model. So anything here will be carbon negative. And in this range between 88 and 138, you will have a combination of carbon price and negative emissions credit that leads to a net zero system. And the last thing to notice is that sharp increases in carbon price achieve only marginal reductions in total emissions. So you have this entire zone here where you almost double the carbon price and you get no further reductions in emissions. And this is different for the negative emissions credit. Every increase in negative emissions credit reduces emissions. And so emissions are more sensitive to the negative emissions credit than the carbon price. A couple of conclusions um, in the end here. 
Emissions from new gray cement plants, steel plants, and refineries can be reduced by about 90% while maintaining production in the UK. Most of these um, optimal technology choices include CCS. A bait and offset in our model incurs similar cost to BAU and offset, but you leave more room for BECs to offset other sectors. Exporting zero carbon cement, steel, and petrochemicals is possible by deploying low carbon production technologies in the UK and you have a potential economic boost. Uh, our model uh, deems it optimal to deploy CCS in industry first and then have power add in later. We found that a high enough border tax adjustment can indeed force the system from offshoring emissions to domestic production. And a negative emissions credit might actually be more effective than a carbon price in achieving net zero, and a combination may be optimal from a public spending perspective. This is something to investigate in the future. Um, I've put my email here in case anyone after the Q&A would like to have a further discussion about this. Uh, I'm, I'm up for that, of course. And uh, yeah, thanks again for joining. I'm uh, very much looking forward to your questions. Yeah, um, thanks very much, Caroline, for that wonderful presentation. And um, we've got some time for questions now. We've got about five to 10 minutes for questions. So if you have some questions, you can just raise your hand or pop them in the chat. But just to um, get things going, I probably just want to ask a general question. Um, what, what are some of the challenges that you're facing or that you face in terms of modeling these different um, sectors that you talked about or general challenges that you talked about and the options for the technology choices that you're, you're, you're choosing as well? What are just the general challenges that you're facing? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's very different modeling industry compared to power. Um, it's very much felt that there has been more work in power, both on the technology level and the system level. And what that means is that it's difficult to obtain data. And um, we're always looking for good technology data to, to put into the model and it's, it's very difficult. You have publications that contradict each other when it comes to, um, to cost or to power requirement, for example. And so this is something where we're constantly improving the model. And that's, that's certainly uh, one, of the, one of the issues. All right, that's fine. Um, was something in the chat box by John Henderson? Do you want to? Let me. Oh, I'm, just... I'm having I'm having trouble to get to the chat. Okay. Um, John, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, hi, John Henderson from the Environment yeah. Agency. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, the, the ten gigawatts. It seems to be about the um, um, optimum amount of becks. Is that right? Um, and the question really was, where will all the trees come from? in a sustainable way. Let me just um, get to the slide you were referring to. Yes, so the amount of effects that is necessary depends very much on how much abatement you can achieve in all the other sectors. And so I, I think you estimate how much you can reasonably achieve everywhere else, and then whatever is left over determines the best capacity that is needed. And I have colleagues working on, on negative emissions technologies, BECs in particular, and as far as I know, maintaining a, a zero carbon supply chain is really challenging, um, which I'm not, I'm not personally modeling, but, um, I think Matil Pajardi has, has done some very interesting work on this. Um, I think we, we use a biomass supply chain in, in this model. And as far as I know, we're not anywhere near the total biomass capacity domestically in the UK. So this would act, we would manage this amount of negative emissions from DEX using um, domestic biomass capacity. Fascinating. Um, and another one, if I may, rather than type it out, um, obviously um, uh, carbon capture on uh, combined gas cycle turbines seems to be uh, quite a big uh, part of the picture. 
how um, will these um, CCGTs with carbon capture be able to meet the requirement of, of the balancing and or capacity market, given that the existing combined gas cycle turbines struggle to do so and, and, and generally speaking are kind of being replaced by uh, smaller, uh, much harder to abate um, gas engines, reciprocating gas engines. I'm assuming you're asking about the, the flexibility? Of yeah, it's a flexible thing. I mean, um, uh, the existing combined gas cycle turbines really do struggle to um, meet the requirements of um, um, uh, the um, balancing market um, when the wind goes off and on and the solar too. Um, and, and, and the answer seems to be, like whether you like it or not, um, significant capacity of um, small reciprocating gas engines. I think it's uh, something like three gigawatts uh, deployed at the moment and more scheduled to be so. So what I can tell you from the systems view, which is my where my work is, is, is located, is that any flexibility that you can achieve from CCGT, CCS is very valuable in the system. And so you can see here the preferred role for CCGT, CCS is a load following role, um, which of course makes sense with, with this flexibility point that you just mentioned. So that's from the systems view the more flexible, the better. And on the process side of things, there has been some interesting work uh, from my boy, from my group that has been um, uh, published. A couple of studies, I think, with pilot plant CCS projects that have investigated how to actually achieve this flexibility on a process scale. And there are a couple of different um, ways to do this, but it's, it uh, is technologically feasible to have a gas turbine and the CCS plant both operate flexibly. So this, um, I, I believe the conclusion was that it is possible indeed. Okay. Yep, so, that's right. Thanks, Caroline. I think, um, so this is just my, just confirming what Caroline just said. Um, and I think it depends on the age of the CCGT. So some of the more modern ones have slightly more flexibility. And so uh, depends on the age of the equipment. Um, but I think you can design them to be more flexible. And it, with that in mind, I think that's something to think about in the future. Okay. Thank you very much, Caroline, for the presentation and the questions that have come through.